Hello, my name is Nuutti Tervo. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the University of Oulu and 6G flagship. And today I give a talk to you about RF signal processing for 6G radios. RF signal processing is a topic where we do transceiver modeling and correction. And that means that we try to understand and model and mitigate, for example, RF impairments of the radio. We try to look the system from a radio waveform perspective. We also do beamforming and try to understand different kind of transceiver architectures and develop simulation tools to simulate hardware as a part of the system. And some example topics we do is, for example, phase noise modeling and compensation. Uh, we also do digital pre-distortion from these two topics. I will discuss more later, later on in the talk. We also do wideband beamforming research and, and then look, for example, joint communication and sensing from RF hardware perspective and look things such as uh, artificial in intelligence and what it means for RF signal processing. And around these topics, we have a team currently of two postdoctoral researchers and seven doctoral thesis researchers. And of course, in addition to this, we collaborate a lot with different kind of uh, research groups in University of Oulu, working uh, with hardware, working with antennas, working with uh, signal processing and communication topics. So this is really about bridging different topics together for a single research area. The first topic in this presentation we discuss is about RF impairments and how they scale as a function of bandwidth and center frequency. As you may know, the research towards 6G is driven a lot by going higher in the frequencies to find more bandwidth and achieve higher data rates. So that's the story you have been hearing many times before. If we want to target for high data rate, we do need bandwidth. So here in the picture, we have some analysis about what kind of bandwidths we require for different data rates by using different modulations. And what is that if we rely on our lower order modulations, we need a huge amount of bandwidth to realize the highest data rates. And this is why we need to worry about RF impairments to improve the signal quality and enable these higher order modulations. And that's why better spectral efficiency and then realize higher data rates more efficiently using the bandwidth. So the RF impairments, they limit the best performance that we can achieve in the system. Here is a simplified overview of radio link with some RF impairments. Here we have used a phased array assumption for transmitter and receiver. So here we see a lot of different kind of RF building blocks that have impact on the signal quality. So first we have here D to A converters that causes quantization noise, which limits the signal quality. We may have some RF and IF frequency responses. We have phase noise from local oscillator. We have IQ imbalance if we have. And, and then we may have also some beamforming errors. And finally, we have a power amplifier that is typically nonlinear and causes distortion to the signal. And in the receiver, we have similar kind of impairments. We have low noise amplifiers that have noise figure. They add noise to the signal. We have maybe beamforming errors also. Then we have also phase noise and frequency responses and IQ imbalance and quantization noise and all that. And all of these impairments, they do have impact on the signal quality and they are all important to consider in high frequency systems. However, these different impairments, they do dominate the performance in different, let's say, power levels, different regions. So here in the picture, we see a radio link signal to noise plus distortion behavior as a function of signal power. So in the x-axis, you have signal power, but you could have also, for example, link range. And in the y-axis, you have the signal quality measured in terms of SNDR. And you see here three different regions. So here in the left, you see a noise limited region, mainly dominated by thermal noise in the receiver. And then in the middle, you see a flat region that is dominated by all other impairments, means phase noise, quantization, IQ imbalance, and all those. And when you increase the power further, you see a region that is limited by nonlinear distortion caused by power amplifiers and also caused by the receiver. 
And when you sum all these impacts together, you can formulate this kind of link SNDR behavior. Another point is that when you increase the center frequency and bandwidth, different things have impact on this link SNDR behavior in a different way. So here in the picture, orange arrows that are bad, and then you see green arrows that are good. And when you increase the center frequency, there are more of these orange bad arrows than the green arrows. So there's a lot of things that actually makes this system a bit more challenging to realize better single quality. So if we start from the left, when we increase the center frequency, we have typically a bit worse noise figure from the low noise amplifiers. We have also more bad loss compared to the single antenna element, and then we have also more bandwidth, which means more noise. So it means that this noise limit region is quite important when we increase the bandwidth and center frequency. And most of these we have to somewhat compensate by using antenna arrays in the receiver. Then in the flat region, we have also problems because we have more phase noise in the higher frequency. We have potentially le less bits in converters to redu reduce the power consumption. And then we have also problems with very wideband RF responses. And they all decrease the signal quality here in the flat region. And then in the higher signal levels, we have problems with nonlinearity again. And furthermore, we have also lower power that we can deliver from a single amplifier. And that also decreases performance of this in the higher level. However, we have also more of those amplifiers, which again compensates part of these effects. And then we have also transmit the array gain that can help us to compensate part of these impacts. But the point is that when we increase the center frequency and bandwidth, this SNDR behavior becomes very narrow in power. So it means that Compared to the narrow band low frequency link, wide band high frequency link, in wide band high frequency link, we have to very accurately hit to this optimal point of power or optimal settings of the receiver and transmitter to actually maximize this signal quality in the best possible way. And this is one of the challenges. Let's look a bit more detail about phase noise and its impact towards higher frequency systems. Phase noise, what it is, it is a local oscillator phase variations as a function of time. And typically this phase noise, it's not fully random like a Gaussian, but uh, each phase value that you measure, is it's very dependent on the previous phase value. So it has memory. And this phase noise, it causes rotations of these constellation points you have in the modulation. It also causes spectral retrode, but mainly it decreases the signal quality measured in terms of EVM. And it also harms, for example, receiver signal processing, for example, equalization and synchronization, and then that in turn decreases the signal quality. So it's quite important thing to consider. Often the phase noise is illustrated by using this kind of phase noise spectra. So here you see one example of it. In x-axis, different offset frequencies. So offset frequency describes kind of a, a speed of the phase variation. And in the y-axis, you have the strength of the variations in dB scale. And that in different offset frequencies, you have different amount of phase noise. So this now describes this phase noise memory dependent behavior. And when you increase the center frequency, small things in the local oscillator, more small mechanical vibrations, noise, it means more in phase. So it multiplies in phase and it means more phase noise. Typically, it means that if you increase the center frequency by a decade, so by 10, you will have 20 dB more phase noise. So this whole curve moves up 20 dB per decade when you increase the center frequency. However, if you look this whole picture here, we have a logarithmic x-axis. So actually, from the wideband single point of view, most of the integrated phase noise content is here in the flat region, and that's actually dominates the wideband performance. So one way to illustrate that is to look this phase as a phase jitter over time. So here we have three different illustrations of phase noise measured over different length of signal. So it's measured over 10 microseconds, 
100 microseconds and so forth. And what you see that if you measure it over a very short period, you have a lot of variation, but it's quite random. It looks like Gaussian. And then when you increase the time of observation, you start to see slower components in the variation. You start to see some trends. And if you increase even further, huge phase variations over a long period, but then still, if you look at it over a short period, it's not necessarily that big. So what this means actually, that it means that if you have long signal, you have a lot of impact from these slow variations. But if you have short signals, you have most impact from these fast variations. And this is important thing to consider because in wideband systems, you typically have shorter signals, which means that most of the dominant phase noise is caused by this wideband phase noise. Okay, to conceptualize this effect, we can illustrate the overall phase noise behavior on the radio link like this. So here we have illustration about how different things have impact on this phase noise spectra that we observe over the whole radio link. So we have, for example, mechanical vibration that causes slow phase variations. We have Doppler from the channel that also causes some phase variations, that, but they are usually quite slow and they can be compensated. And in the phase noise spectra, we have then two regions, the region on the left that can be compensated and region on the right that can't be really compensated by using simple level compensation techniques. And this overall phase noise impacts is then are determined by integrating this phase noise spectra from some smallest frequency that matters, F1 up to the highest frequency that matters, which is typically related to the bandwidth of the single. And this smallest frequency that matters is related to the speed of the compensation that you can do for the phase noise in the receiver. And now what we can do is that we can take this flat region of the phase noise and we can model it as a function of center frequency and bandwidth with the certain conditions and we can then derive dependency of center frequency and bandwidth on this overall phase noise limited signal to noise ratio. What we can observe here is that here we see different signal-to-noise ratios in different bandwidth and center frequency combinations. And we see that if we want to have very high signal-to-noise ratio, let's say 30 dB, it's quite challenging to achieve that with very wide bandwidth and very high center frequency if you don't do something for this wideband phase noise. And this can be then turned into an equivalent data rate where you actually see that this wideband phase noise, it does limit the maximum achievable data rate that you can achieve in the system. And that actually means that if you double, for example, the bandwidth, you don't necessarily double the data rate in these higher frequencies. And that depends also on the center frequency of the system. And now to remind is that this is only the impact of phase noise. So if you add all the other impairments here, PA nonlinearity, IQ imbalance, quantization noise, you have to leave also some room for those. So it means that this overall data rate indeed is limited by RF impairments. Okay, the another topic I'm going to discuss is PA nonlinear distortion and and using digital pre-distortion to compensate for it in the higher frequency systems. Power amplifiers, they cause nonlinear distortion to the signal. It can be seen as, a, for example, addition channel power ratio, but they also decrease the signal quality measures in terms of error vector magnitude. And one of the most common ways to compensate for that is to use digital pre-distortion. In digital pre-distortion, what you do is that you make some, some sort of a feedback receiver to measure the BA behavior, usually in real time, and then you model the inverse of this BA nonlinear behavior, and then you apply the inverse at the input to compensate the BA nonlinear distortion and achieve linear signal at the output. And what we have been doing a lot here in the RF signal processing team is that we have been trying to find ways to use digital pre-distortion for phased antenna arrays. And why this is interesting topic is that in these systems you have multiple power amplifiers that shares a single digital input. So it means that you have to linearize multiple amplifiers with a single DBD. 
So in these systems, you have to consider and you have to design this DBD concept again, all the way from the fact that how you measure the BAs to the fact that what you want to really linearize. And this is especially important and interesting when these power amplifiers are very different, which they often are in practice in real systems. And the interesting thing here is that when you design DBD linearization for this kind of systems, if these amplifiers have different kind, different shapes of nonlinear distortion, you can linearize the common impact quite well. So if you design a linearization for a sum of these power amplifiers, you can linearize the signal, but necessarily none of these actual amplifiers becomes linear. And that will have impact on the beam that this distortion forms over the space. So it means that if you linearize an array of power amplifiers, you also have impact on the beam of these distortion components. And this is very important effect to understand in the array linearization. One way to illustrate this is to do DPD of this kind of amplitude tapered arrays. In this kind of system, you have very different amount of distortion in different antennas because you drive the power amplifiers in different power levels. In center PAs, they are very nonlinear, and then in this side PAs, they are quite linear. And if you design DPD for some of this kind of uh, amplifiers, this kind of systems, you can linearize the effect quite well. But when you go and look what actually happens is that you see that none of these power amplifiers becomes actually very linear. So you see that in the combined response, some of the PAs compress and some of the PAs expand. And this expansion then compensates some of this compression and it can do this kind of over the air linearization. So it means that these PAs helps each other to make a linearization as combined over the air even using the antennas. And if you observe what this means for the radiator distortion, it means that this DPD makes a null for the distortion in the angle where you have designed the DPD, which could be, for example, the steering angle. And this is interesting effect and quite relevant to consider. And this can be solved by using different techniques to make these PAs similar. For example, in this paper, we used PA bias control to control this a nonlinear behavior in such a way that we made them more similar. And then when you design common linearization for this kind of system, you can actually achieve linearization in all PA outputs. And the good thing in that is that the overall linearization performance in that case is not that directive. So it means that when you linearize this system, you linearize all directions and this beam of the distortion is not necessarily having this kind of null behavior in your steering angle. And if you look this from the total radiated distortion, ACLR, adjacent channel power point of view, this is much better approach from that perspective. Obviously, there's some sort of trade-off between linearity that we can achieve in the steering angle by combining these non-linearities and then total radiated linearity that we can achieve if we integrate this overall distortion over the whole space or, or calculate the average distortion over the PAs and antennas. And how we can understand this is, for example, that if we look the beam indicators, for example, side lobe level of the signal over the varying envelopes, so over the different instantaneous power levels of the signals that would be having communication signal, we see that different values of the signal, they experience different side lobe levels. So the higher values of the signal may have, for example, higher side lobes than the lower values of the signal. So it means that this beam is varying as a function of this single envelope. What did we learn? We learned that the impact of RF impairments depends on the center frequency and bandwidth. And we learned that all these impairments, they have impact, but they do dominate the performance in different regions, different power levels. Then we learned that phase noise is important impairment in 6G systems, and it dominates the performance of very wideband systems and when using very wideband signals. And we also learned that using arrays offers possibilities for this for compensation of RF impairments, and we used an onlinear distortion there as an example to illustrate that. To conclude, these all RF impairments, they have to be addressed to materialize the full 
potential 6G systems and optimize the signal quality. That concludes my talk, so thank you for listening.